You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. thing as I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm guessing you didn't even hear that intro because I can't turn this thing down because it's blasting loud and it won't, and antivirus is popping up every second. McAfee can go, oh my goodness. That loon bag, by the way, is the worst human being on planet Earth. Multi-billionaire psychopath who basically built viruses that come free on your computer. I can't stand that person. Anyways, happy uh, Christmas Eve to y'all. This was supposed to be a super exciting, happy um, thing, but when it takes you 45 minutes to boot up a laptop, you get a little cranky. But anyways, I just wanted to uh, be sure to get something out to you today because this was an absolutely massive and awesome football game, and to not do a podcast after that is just not really a thing that I'm willing to do. So here, here's what I'm thinking. We're not going to do any ads today. We're not going to do anything. I'm just going to give a couple quick thoughts, and then I'm going to let you get back to your Christmas parties, and I'm going to get back to mine. I had heard um, before the broadcast, actually I think it was this morning, whatever, somebody at some point had made the comment that there's not something wrong with the Green Bay Packers necessarily. There's a problem with how we perceive the Green Bay Packers. I think that is 100% correct. We expect something from the Green Bay Packers because we have been programmed as Packer fans, and even outside of that, the media has expectations. Think about when this game started, what happened. Same thing that happens before every single Packers game. They zoom in on Aaron Rodgers warming up and say, there he is, Aaron Rodgers. That's, that's been the Green Bay Packers. This man has drugged this team, kicking and screaming to playoff after playoff after playoff terrible defenses, no pass rush, just the worst of the worst, No, how many years of zero running ability whatsoever. And so we look at a game like this, and I, although I haven't heard a lot of complaining, there's still a feeling of, no, nah, that still wasn't good enough. Right After win, after win, after win, we just hear that wasn't good enough. And there's something to it. There, it's, it's not perfect, and of course there's room for growth, but I think if we can change our way of thinking about this football team will have a lot more appreciation. So I want to do a little exercise to kind of illustrate my point. Because we look at this team and we say, this team isn't good enough. Tom Silverstein again today was kind of saying, I still don't think they're as good as the 49ers, which is fine. You know, you, you, can, you can rank teams however you want to rank teams, I don't care. But it's just this incessant need to say they're not good enough as a team. And I think really what people are saying is Aaron Rodgers isn't as good as we are used to, therefore the team isn't good enough. Let me ask you this, though. The Packers beat the Minnesota Vikings, who are a very good team. They have not lost at home. I don't even know the last time they lost at home. They don't usually lose at home. Do you think the Green Bay Packers win without Zadarius Smith? Pretty simple no, right? Do you think the Packers win without Aaron Jones? I don't think so. Let me ask you this. Do you think the Packers win without Alan Lazard? I don't know that they do. He was, he was, he, I mean, all due respect to Devontae and all these other guys that, you know, Aaron Jones and all that, Alan Lazard was huge in this game. He came up big on some real clutch catches that we needed conversions, and he was the one that got it. If there was a big play, it was probably Lazard or Devontae or Aaron Jones. Do you think we win this game without the play of the offensive line, specifically Brian Balaga and David Bakhtiari, when you're talking about a guy like Daniil Hunter? And by the way, last week against a guy like Khalil Mack, and all year they've been going up against some of the best pass rushers in football. Do you think we beat this team if Daniil Hunter did to, to this offense the same thing that the Bosa brothers did to the Packers? If Aaron Rodgers wasn't clean as often as he was clean, what are the odds that we win this game? So do we win this game without the offensive line, specifically the tackles? No. So we needed David Bakhtiari. We needed Brian Balaga. We needed Aaron Jones. We needed David ba- um, Devontae. Devontae Adams, and we needed Aaron Jones, or Alan Lazard. I can't even keep track of them all. And Zadarius Smith. What about Kenny Clark? Not not just the times he brought pressure and his big, you know, sack, but how about the, the amount of attention he gets? How about even on the plays when he's not getting a sack, the amount of pressure he's bringing constantly in the quarterback's face to cause a panic? Do you think we win without him? Maybe. Maybe. 
but he helped a lot. How about Kevin King? You think we win this game without Kevin King? And, and I'm uh, specifically the interception, which was massive, and Aaron Rodgers even pointed that out in particular as far as being a turning point. But the pass rush wasn't always getting home. There was coverage going on down the field, and, and we'll talk about PFF probably not tomorrow because it's Christmas, but the day after. And I'll, I'll just spoiler alert, Kevin King was graded very highly, and you don't get a very high grade because you were garbage but had one pick. How about Blake? How about the ability to stop the run? And Zedarius was great against the run, but he wasn't alone in that. Kenny, Blake, B.J. Goodson, if they were able to get that run game going, do we win this game? The point is, this whole team stepped up, and we get so laser-focused on Aaron Rodgers throwing passes a little bit behind a guy, and we let that cloud the fact that this is a team that is a very good team. Jair, Kevin King, Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, Blake Martinez, B.J. Goodson, I go right down the line. Guys that maybe you're having a rough year, who are maybe, you know, 50-50, but guys that when you need them are showing up in a big way, especially down the stretch. To have to have a game like this and how important this game is, to have that be one of the games where Blake kind of stands out in a positive light, to have Devontae have his big breakout game after he's been kind of... And by the way, let's, let's also not act like Devontae's been garbage this year. Not that anyone necessarily is, but Devontae's very close to cracking 1,000 yards. Aaron Jones also is close to cracking 1,000 yards and also leads the NFL in touchdowns. Zedarius Smith is the best pass rusher in football. So all this garbage about how the Packers aren't good enough, all this nonsense about how they're not up there with these other upper echelon teams, the fact that the, the, the Vikings were a foregone conclusion to win that game, how disgustingly ridiculous is that? The lack of respect for what this team has built. And I'm not talking about considering, considering nothing. I'm not talking about considering we have, you know, a first-year head coach. No, I'm talking about compared to the rest of the NFL. This is the best run game the Packers have had maybe in my lifetime. This is the best pass rush this team has had maybe in my lifetime. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at what happened back in the Reggie White days. If you ding ding in my ear one more time, laptop, I'm going to smack you. And this is a team that, that, I mean, to be completely honest, look, I, they can't complete passes deep down the field. I don't know what the problem is. I have a theory that is nothing more than just a theory. But I thought the offense actually played really well. They didn't have a hard time getting into a rhythm. The only two problems they had were turnovers, which, to be completely honest, I think the worst turnover, and most people would disagree, I think the worst one was actually Aaron Rodgers' pick. All three of them were great plays by the defense. One of them was a perfectly timed punch to Aaron Jones when he's trying to shift from one hand into the other, so it was just at the the exact right time to do it. It happened to take a perfect bounce right into the guy's arms. The second one, exact same thing with Jimmy Graham. He's holding it fine. It was just a perfectly placed punch, which, believe it or not, not speaking from experience, but that's an incredibly hard thing to do because I watch every single week guys try to do it. And in full speed... These guys are like punching people in the neck trying to hit footballs. It's, I mean, it's really tough full speed. These are perfectly placed punches. And then that pick, which was just wildly underthrown, I mean, it was, it was a bad ball. There were a bunch of them in this game. But it was also, again, a great play by the defense. But other than that, what was really the problem? The, the, the biggest stall outs were turnovers and trying to, you know, throw the ball deep unnecessarily. But when they were content to just take five, six yards, the offense was unstoppable. They could throw screens to Devontae. They can run for five, you know, little rub routes for nine. If they're content to just grind their way down the field, which, okay, here's my theory on it. Somebody else had mentioned, I think, during the game, and I believe it was toward the beginning of the game, one of the announcers had something to the effect of, you see the elements of a Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan-style offense in some of these plays, and then you see elements of things that Aaron Rodgers likes to do. You You want to know what my theory is? There is an effort, and there's been an effort, to blend the Aaron Rodgers, Mike McCarthy-style offense with the Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, Matt LaFleur-style offense. I think the Matt LaFleur stuff is really starting to take off, and it's really starting to do well, and they're really starting to understand it. And I think the Mike McCarthy stuff still just doesn't work. And I know that's very black and white, and I'm sure there are instances where that's not exactly the case, but I think big picture, that is a lot of what we're seeing. You're even starting to see this outside zone really start to kick off, which at the beginning of the year was not doing anything. Some of the biggest plays, I think both touchdowns were outside zone runs. That kind of stuff the offensive line just could not do. They didn't know how to do it. It's working to perfection. In that Vikings game, it worked beautifully. 
And I think the, the sooner Aaron Rodgers starts to see it, which he did in this game, I think you, you start to see the success, and I think you get more buy-in, and I think as the team becomes more comfortable with it, we see more and more of this true you know, Kyle Shanahan-style offense, a, a, a true Matt LaFleur-style offense, and you start to get away from this Aaron Rodgers-type stuff because, you know, it, dude, bottom line, it's not working. But, it, but it, it, you know, it might be because we don't have the personnel, we don't have this, we don't have that, but it's only going to get harder as we start to build around Matt LaFleur. Because in the draft and in free agency, when we go out and get off into pieces, we're not getting guys that run Mike McCarthy-style offenses. We're not looking for those guys. We're looking for the Matt LaFleur-style guys. And those guys are going to be really good at running Matt LaFleur-style plays and maybe not quite as good as running the uh, Mike McCarthy-style stuff. Now, granted, you just get a really good wide receiver. He can probably do a little bit of everything, like Devontae. It doesn't matter. You know, We can run Mike McCarthy stuff. We can run Matt LaFleur stuff, whatever. But that's, that's, that's my thought. You look at teams like the 49ers, the Minnesota Vikings, the Rams. These are teams that grind their way down the field, and they just chip away at you. The Patriots. Some, I mean, the, the best offenses in football, with the exception maybe of the Saints and the Chiefs. Those teams take pretty big chunks. But at their best, they run, they're run a run-first team, and they, they build off of that. And, of course, there's supposed to be big plays built in as well, and all those systems and those things just aren't working, and that needs to be fixed. But I really do think there's an element of that. I think the things that are working are the, the true Kyle shanahan style offenses and the, you know, just sort of spread it out, drop back, look to throw 20 yards down the field. That's, it just doesn't work. It does not work. And whether it's the personnel or whatever it is, we got to just start walking away from it. And even if it is more of just a, a personnel thing, I don't, I, who cares what it is? Stop it. Because you only got three chances. And if you run the ball and get two yards... And the next play that you decide to play is a 30-yard shot that goes nowhere. Now it's third and eight, and guess what? We're not super great at converting those. And that's how you go from grinding all the way down the field and looking real good to all of a sudden we're punting, and it's like, where did this come from? And it came from the idea that, you know what, let's try to take a shot here. And that doesn't work, and instead of being in second and four, second and three, or third and three or whatever, we're in third and eight because we can't just let it go. Now, look, if it's, if it's second and four and you want to take a shot, okay, fine. We can probably pick up four. But my guess is if it's second and four and we're going to try to take a shot, it's probably going to be third and four, unless we take a sack. This stuff just doesn't work. But again, getting back to the original point, the, the offense looked great. And, and, and here's the other really exciting thing. It got better toward the end, the, the second half, which is uncharacteristic of the Packers' offense. Usually they go up early at the beginning and then they sort of fall off. I think the real big thing here, and and Aaron Rodgers sort of alluded to it, was quote-unquote sticking to the plan. What they did is they just started accepting, let's just take five. They started looking at it and saying, you know what, we need to do two things. We need to drain the clock, and we need to grind down this defense. And the way in which you do that isn't taking 20-yard chunks. It's by running the ball. And and if if they're going to give my guy a cushion, I'm going to throw a quick little screen out to him. And he'll pick up five automatically. And they just wore the defense down. And here's my here's my point. Do that anyway. If 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 the Packers are down by 13 points, do it anyway. That's when the offense is at its best. This is an offense that likes to work with running backs and tight ends. They like to take five, six, seven, eight yard chunks. Of course, every system, every team likes to take a 20 yard chunk here and there. But you don't build an offense around that. This isn't the air raid system. We're not trying to spread it out five wide and just launch it all over the yard. Understand the, the, the team needs to understand its identity, and I, I feel like toward the second half, the team really started to grasp it, that this is who we are and we're going to embrace it. And it looked beautiful. The defense is embracing its identity as a mean, physical entity, and that is something this defense has needed for a long time. Mike Daniels was preaching that back in... 2014 or whatever it is screaming about tired you know being tired about being called soft because the Packers defense was called soft because it was soft this is not a soft defense Kenny Clark, Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith these are hard hitting folks watching Jair and Kevin King smoke guys on the outside and when they try to do their little wide receiver screens these boys like to hit this is this is a January defense This is a February defense. This is a playoff defense. They like it cold. They like it hard. They like it violent. 
And the thing is, I think the offense does too. They just got to embrace it. Aaron Rodgers isn't used to that. He's not used to a grinded out offense. He's used to a finesse offense. We're going to have some real beautiful route running to get some separation. And I'm going to throw a perfect pass right up into that soft little zone there. That's cool if you can make it work, but they can't make it work. But you know what they can make work? Bring your six foot seven wide receivers in and have them block some little cornerback out of existence so that Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams can grind five, six, seven yards a pop. Alan Lazard, by the way, is awesome. And and the reason that I say that, you know, because he's, he's one of those guys that is sort of the alternative number two. Sometimes he pops up and he's a legit number two like he was in this game. He was a legit number two. But sometimes he kind of disappears, and that's fine. But here, here's what I love about Alan Lazard. He is basically a tight end. And what I mean by that, not just his body type, because of course he's built like one, the great thing about Alan Lazard is he's basically primarily being brought into this offense because of his blocking ability. That's why they want to keep him in. He's a great blocker, and it's an unbelievable mismatch. Because when you bring a wide receiver in, and they keep bringing everybody in tight, which made me nervous when I saw that at the beginning of the, the season, because I'm like, why don't you want to spread everybody out? That's what all these other teams were doing that I was watching. They spread everybody out so that you don't have very many people. It's a numbers game. We got more numbers here, and we're going to run on you. The reason we're bringing everybody in is because they like their odds. I like the odds of my guys blocking up your guys. We, we like congestion. It's organized chaos. We don't want it all spread out so that you got, your guys can just find the hole and flow through it. No, we, we're going to get our big, giant, strong, wide receivers like Geronimo Allison and Alan Lazard in there to pop you right in the mouth, which, by the way, Geronimo isn't even that big. He just plays like it. But, but the thing with Alan Lazard is he's a tight end insofar as, what you know, He's a wide receiver, so you play him like a wide receiver, and he blocks you out of existence. But then he'll go out and start running routes. How, how do you account for Alan Lazard to account for This thing's acting crazy on me. Do you, do you play him like a tight end? Do you play him like a wide receiver? Because the, the cornerbacks are not doing a very good job. If he's coming in and blocking cornerbacks, and if he's just playing big man football, you're almost better off putting a, a linebacker on him. The problem is, dude's a wide receiver. You can't be putting linebackers on him. So, look, I, I acknowledge it's not a perfect team. No team is a perfect team, but we need to adjust what we think this team is. And I think the Green Bay Packers need to adjust. All of us do, in, including the organization. Embrace what this team is. This is no longer a team that's going to put up 40 points on the back of Aaron Rodgers. And you know what? That's a good thing. We're not winning Super Bowls with that. That team never once won a Super Bowl. The only time that team ever won a Super Bowl is the time that the defense decided to play out of its mind and became one of the better defenses in football. We didn't win on the back of Aaron Rodgers. Granted, he was in his prime and he was playing out of his mind, and we probably don't win without him either. But the point is, you can't just have a team that is all Aaron Rodgers all the time where he's just the best quarterback in football, and yeah, it makes us feel good to brag about it, but that team's never going to win a Super Bowl. We need a team that is Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith and Kenny Clark and Jair and Amos and Bakhtiari and Balaga and Aaron Jones, and you're just getting hit from every angle and you don't know what to do. You don't just come out and account for Aaron Rodgers and say, don't worry, we'll figure out the rest. It's not Aaron Rodgers and his three wide receivers and who cares about the rest. It's we got a lot of homework to do for this team. And that's a good thing and that's something to be excited about. Anyways, I think I'm done. That's that's the crux of it to be excited about. It's not perfect. I'm not guaranteeing a Super Bowl. I'm not even saying they're the best team in football. Who cares about any of that? Who cares if, if we, if you, you know, you can line them up against the Vikings and say which team's better? Who cares? Packers won, won the division. Do you care based on what metric somebody comes up with if somebody says the Vikings are technically better? I don't. I care about winning. I care about winning the division. I care about making the playoffs and, and winning in the playoffs and getting to the Super Bowl and winning a Super Bowl. I don't care if they're the eighth best team with a Super Bowl trophy. Just win it. So, anyways, I think I think now I'm done. So, <laughs> I'm super amped up. I know you guys are all super amped up. Just wanted to get this out to you real quick. And I'm um, planning on getting a little, very quick little Christmas gift out to you. Not really a gift, but a, a podcast message uh, early tomorrow morning. And then we'll be back, be back to our regular schedule programming, I think, on Thursday. So you folks have yourselves a great Christmas Eve. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.